Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. I wanted to take a little step back from the regular broadcast this evening to really lay out my heart on a very serious issue regarding the people that are in the land of Israel today. Uh, indirectly, though, this the things that I'm going to speak tonight about, about the different prophecies relating to Israel's existence, Israel in their homeland, the coming of the Messiah. So many, so many people are speaking about the coming of the Messiah right now, uh, saying rabbis are looking for the coming of the Messiah. And at the same time, there's all kinds of disputes of whether or not the Jews that are there in Israel today are actually the real Jews. You have the Khazarian theories that are going on. Uh, you also have a huge movement of uh, black people that, all over the world that are saying that they are the real Jews and it's not the Jews that are in Israel. All kinds of discrepancies that are going on. And for me, this is not a race issue at all. This is simply to say, are the Israelis, are they the real Jews? And if so, what are the prophecies that back this up? What are the prophecies to the real Jews? And where are those real Jews today? Are they in Israel? Are they still scattered all over the world? And, and, what is, and, and does it answer the time that we're living in? See, there's so many things that are going on, and we've got to get to the bottom of this because it's really becoming chaotic. All right, now, before I start the message, let me just clear one thing up. I believe that, that, that Israel, based on Scripture, is multi, multicultural mixed to begin with, especially after all the years of dispersion. The House of Israel, in fact, being dispersed for nearly 3,000 years. The, the House of Judah, which is what's been dispersed since uh, 70 AD, has been dispersed nearly 2,000 years now themselves. And they've mixed into every kind of culture you can imagine over the years. Uh, we also know that there were, there's scriptural evidence of Ethiopians being part of the Jews because of the intermarriage. Uh, intermarriage was many, many times uh, throughout the, the course of Israel's history. We see this. It is common. Ruth as well. The Mobonitess, uh, who marries in uh, through Naomi's family, marries into Israel. Uh, so we have all kinds of things here, but you know, different different cultures, different color skins, etc. So I'm not against the Ethiopian lineage of the Jewish people at all. That is very much so. Now, does it mean that every single Ethiopian is a Jew? I don't think so. Um, but is there many that are? Of course there are. You know. But so let me just make that part clear to begin with. It's not a racial thing, but there are those that believe because the black people in America have suffered greatly during the slave days, etc., that this was a curse that they were going through, etc. Uh, and this is why this happened to them. Well, then again, what about the Jews that have been through the Holocaust? Speaking of the Holocaust, we just had the Holocaust Memorial uh, time, but not just the Holocaust of Germany where six million Jews were murdered, but we've also had the pogroms, we've had Stalin, we've had Mussolini, we've had the Spanish Inquisition. The Jews have just been absolutely bludgeoned over the last 2,000 years, uh, at least the ones that are in Israel today with this claim as well. So they've also suffered tremendously as a result. So now let's get right into this message though, because it goes, like I said, beyond the part of race and color and everything else, uh, because God, the color doesn't matter. Even there's Jews today, it's funny, because my black brothers and sisters are very concerned about, as far as those that believe that they are the Jews, and they may very well be Jewish descent. I don't say that they're not, but that's one side, but then you've got the, the, many of the Jews that are in Israel today that have more of a, a olive complexion. They would say somebody like myself, well, you're not a Jew, Steve, because you're too pale-skinned to be a Jew. But yet both my parents are Jews, Sephardic and Ashkenazi. Depends on which one you look into the family. My mother Ashkenazi, my father Sephardic and Moroccan Jews. I just so happen to get a little bit lighter skin than the rest of my family had. But why did I get the different color skin? Well, that's because of, again, uh, different family genealogies in there. Although the majority of all my family are all Jews, you know, we do have a Gentile here and there that got married into the family. And my grandmother, my dad's mother being one, she had the red hair and the, the uh, light complexion skin there. 
that's where I got my looks as well. I didn't get the nose of my grandfather or the olive skin of my mother and the curly hair and the dark eyes. Didn't get any of that. I got it all from my grandmother that was just the opposite. But see, that's the point. It doesn't matter. Even historical evidence shows that Joseph actually had red hair, believed even by the sages that he had red hair. David Roll, archaeologist and Egyptologist, friend of mine that I actually uh, wrote about him in the book Yom Suf, a chapter about his works there, uh, on his books that he did, Pharaohs and Kings, he discovered incredible evidence for this as well, and uh, so much more that could be said. But anyhow, all that doesn't really matter as a, 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 when it comes down to it. It's just little pet peeves that people have to try to justify their Jews because their color of eyes or because their curly hair, etc. That's what Hitler was doing. I think the time comes that we need to put aside that kind of nonsense because that's what got many of our people killed. And some of them actually survived because they did not have the Jewish look. I guess I would be in the case of not looking so Jewish. It might benefit me in that case there. But my big mouth, it probably wouldn't benefit me at all because I would flat out say who I am. Anyway, let's go right to the scripture and see what's going on, though, about the Israelis. Are they the Jews today? Let's look at the scriptures, the prophecies of Hosea. Beginning in chapter 5, the last two verses here. My Jewish brothers, let me tell you something before I really start on this. What I'm going to say is hard to take. This is not a message of just patting everybody on the back. In order for you to really see who we are as Jews, who we were 2,000 years ago, who the Messiah is, I have to be pretty blunt tonight, more so than I've ever done. I'll probably withhold in some things, but I have to be blunt about it. All right, so let's look at this. For I will be unto Ephraim as a lion, and as a young lion unto the house of Judah. Ephraim, by the way, is the house of Israel. I even I will tear and go away. I will take away and none shall rescue him. Hosea goes on. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. We get into chapter 6. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn. And he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. After two days... Will he revive us? In the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness as a morning cloud and as the early dew, it goeth away. Wow. Here's where we start getting tough, though. We have to begin to examine the prophecy to understand what really has been going on in our history and why have we suffered as the Jewish people have we have suffered. God says here in Hosea chapter 5, verse 15, I will go and return to my place until or until they acknowledge their offense. Now, Hosea makes this prophecy. But you have to remember, God is giving in verse 14, I will be unto Ephraim as a lion and as a young lion to the house of Judah. Okay, Ephraim went into captivity over 700 years before that of the house of Israel, or excuse me, the house of Judah, right? The house of Judah does go into captivity as well. Hosea is prophesying, see, he's prophesying, one, they're going to be scattered, and then he's also prophesying they're going to be returned. The returning is done, not in the second day. After two days will he revive us, all right? Well, if you go back to after the two days and you look at the time that the house of Israel was in captivity or gone into or scattered throughout the world, I should say, that was 700 years before, almost 800 years before the coming of Yeshua. So after two days, he will revive us. And in the third day, he will raise us up. 
So something has happened somewhere along the line, and it had to have been after the Dark Ages that there began to be a reviving. Doesn't say exactly when, but he just says, after two days, he will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up. So somewhere in the third day, and by the way, that's been over 2,700 years ago. Almost 2,800 years ago now. So we are definitely in the third day. We are at the time where God is going to raise up both the house of Ephraim and the house of Judah. But notice what he says, I will go and turn, return to my place. God is saying this. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense. So Judah had to go into captivity as well. And then Israel has to come to a place where, or in this case here, that there, that there is an offense that they have done and they have to acknowledge it. Well, what did, what did Ephraim do? Ephraim, as we know, was beginning to serve all kinds of idols and gods. But what did Judah do? What did Judah do to, go, to end up in captivity? In fact, what did Judah do to go into captivity that God says he's going to turn his face away from them until they acknowledge their, their, their offense? And then he says, and seek me, seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. Hmm. In their affliction, they will seek me early. Well, you know what's kind of interesting? The Holocaust itself definitely was probably one of the heaviest blows of affliction the Israelis have ever had in the history of the Jews for the last 2,000 years. And that affliction there definitely caused Israel to cry out unto God that brought them back to their homeland for the first time in almost 2,000 years. So now are they, as the prophecy of Hosea says, are they now in the land waiting for the third day? He will raise us up. Because it's also based on Ephraim's dispersion, the timeline. See, at, notice, after two days, will he revive us? Hmm. Maybe that happens to be speaking about the house of Judah, separately from the house of Ephraim. Anybody ever think about that before? And my Jewish brethren, I need you to really seriously, from the bottom of your heart, to, 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 to bear with me tonight and think about what I'm telling you. After two days, he will revive us. See, 2,000 years, we have been in our issues there. Almost 2,000 years. Remember, 70 AD, we're in 2016, so we're still lacking we are still lacking, what would that be if it's 2016, doing the math on that, we're lacking about, what, 54 years of being the second day is complete and we go into the third day? So somewhere in this time right there, he's going to revive Israel. Our second day is here. We're at a time of reviving, and the house of Judah is in the homeland for the reviving. See, in the third day, he will raise us up. Why does it say raise us up? Remember the prophecy about the dry bones in Ezekiel's vision? Ezekiel 37, he says, Son of man, prophesy, can these bones live again? Mm -hmm. See, in the third day, he will raise us up. See, so the house of Ephraim, it's been 2,700, almost 2,800 years for them. They're in the third day. Those dry bones have got to be raised up. It's the whole house of Israel. They've been scattered now for almost 3,000 years. All right, let's move on. Hosea 6, 5. Therefore have I hewed them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and thy judgments are as, as the light that goeth forth. For I desired mercy, and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. See? But they like men have transgressed the covenant. There have they dealt treacherously against me. Where did they deal treacherously against God? Because he wanted mercy. Not sacrifice. Now, he permitted sacrifice. We know that. It's a Levitical law. It is permitted. Moses actually wrote these laws out. But 
I know it's permitted, and I'm going to show you that. I can prove it by Ezekiel's prophecy as well. It is a permitted thing that God did, all right? Also, Jeremiah says the same thing. Yeshua says the th same thing in chapter 12. For I desired mercy, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. He wanted you to know him. He wanted that personal relationship with you. Gosh, friends. But they, like men, have transgressed the covenant. There have they dealt treacherously against me. Where? Right where he said it. You weren't showing the mercy. You didn't, you didn't covet the knowledge of God more than the burnt offerings. Israel, this applies to you, O house of Judah. And let me tell you something. That's a proof right there. Had the... Had, had, because, you know, the Pharisees, let me tell you something. Rabbi Tovia Singer has made the statement. I've heard him say it before on, on his videos. The Pharisees of today, or, or excuse me, of 2,000 years ago, are the Orthodox Jews of today. I agree with him. He says this in one of his debates with, the, with a Christian, uh, some of the Christian scholars, and he does obliterate them in the debate, by the way. You know? And me and Tovia, we've, we've discussed some things by email, back and forth on these things. But the thing was, he's, he's obliterated them in these debates. But my challenge back to my, bro my brother is this here. If offering the sacrifice, which you're about to try to reinstitute, re they've already been doing the sacrifices again anyway. They've already reinstituted sacrificing. They just don't have a temple to do it in. All right? But if it was what God wanted of you, do you think there was any lack of sacrifice or burnt offerings at the time that Yeshua was here? No, there wasn't. The problem that you lacked was mercy and knowledge of God. This is where you went wrong. You didn't have that. He, did, he wasn't interested in your sacrifices. And for my Christian friends, you already know that I think it's Paul that says, sacrifice and offering, they, they cannot, they cannot, uh, they do not, what is it? They do not remit sins. There's a remembrance of sin year after year after year. All right? So, in that case, Israel, they were religiously offering the sacrifices up unto God. Right? So we get down to verse 9. And as a troop of robbers wait for a man, so the company of priests murder in the way by consent. Wait a minute now. This has nothing to do with the warriors of Israel. This is the priest. So the company of priests murder in the way by consent, for they commit lewdness. What were they murdering? Can anybody answer that one? I have seen a horrible thing in the house of Israel. There is whoredom among uh, of, of Ephraim, Israel is defiled. Also, Judah, he has set and harvest for thee when I returned the captivity of my people. He set a harvest for thee. In other words, Yeshua was coming after you came home from Babylon, but he wasn't received very well. Now, just to, to, to bring out a point so you understand historically, this is from the accents of James. It's part of the Syriac gospel. It is very much believed by scholars. It is an authentic book. It's not to say it's fake or anything like that. It is a real book. You can, you can check it out. Uh, you can actually get it called the accents of James yourself and read it. Uh, I want to just bring this out here because this is supposedly penned by James himself. Uh, there is some debate among scholars. Uh, this is from before the time of Clement. Uh, with the homilies, it is believed to be from the first century, but it is part of the Syriac gospel, which is the Middle Eastern Christians actually consider this part of their own Bible. It says, uh, let me just read what he says here. It's kind of important. When Moses delayed, the, these made an idol, because he's talking about basically how the sacrifices began. Uh, these made an idol uh, uh, in the image of the apis, which they had seen in Egypt, an image of gold. They bowed down to it, those after all sorts of demonstrations were not able to put 
away the evil customs from their hearts. Because of this, Moses then come from the mountain by the command of God and left. And, and I said before, the shortest road that goes from Egypt to Judea, he led them in that vast wilderness so that the time of the 40 years, he might by another time, in the giving of the law, be able to change those evils which clung to them from an extended time with the many customs of Egyptians. All right, going into 1.36.1. Therefore, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and saw that vice as he was a good and faithful steward, he discerned that it was not possible to take from the people all the sickness of love of idol worship which was in them from the long stay, and that they could not be easily rid of it and bring it to an end because of their evil upbringing from the Egyptians. Because of this, he did permit them to sacrifice, but told them they could do only this in the name of God. See, so he could cut off and bring to an end half of the sickness, but the correction of the other half, it was for another time in the hand of someone else, as it was right and whose care it would be in the one whom he said, a prophet, shall the Lord your God raise up for, for you like me. Hear him in everything. Anyone who does not hear him shall surely die. It shall be known that, that, that this is the one that has given up his soul to destruction. All right, now, the reason I bring this out is to try to, to dovetail this in, because notice what it says. So the cup, and this is in Hosea 6, 9. So the company of priests murder in the way by consent. Now, I put a note in here just for a reminder for me. I just, I need you to be patient with what I'm trying to bring this out for. So watch how this works for our good. All right, in other words, we, the point I guess we're really looking at in this case here, God never intended for his creation to be killed. This was never his intent. But he's going to make this evil work for, him, for good, for our good, in fact. Okay. So, yes, I know sacrifices are there. Yes, I know that, that it is a type of Yeshua. Clearly, I know that. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Absolutely, I understand all of this, but it is all this is all happening because the fall itself in the Garden of Eden that got everything out of cater. All right, but watch what the watch what happens with the Word of God. It is beautiful how this plays out and how there's little things that maybe you never thought about before. This is both for my believing brothers and sisters uh, in Yeshua, those of you in Jesus, however you want to say his name, and those of you that, 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 that as well are Jews, I believe it will help you if you really look at what I'm trying to say here. Notice Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 24, because they had not executed, this is God speaking to the prophet Ezekiel, they had not executed my judgments, but had despised my statutes, and had polluted my Sabbaths, and their eyes were after their father's idols. Isn't that what he just said? Isn't that what he said over here? All the sickness of the love of idol worship, right? What, what, what does Ezekiel say? He says the same thing. My, uh, but had despised my statutes and had polluted my Sabbaths and their eyes were after their father's idols. This is just exactly what James said too. They were doing, James knew it, right? Wherefore, I gave them also statues that were not good. Now, this is God saying this to Israel. I gave them statues that were not good and judgments whereby they should not live. And I, and I polluted them in their own gifts. What gifts? Where they brought the firstborn of all their animals. See? And that they caused to pass through the fire all that openeth the womb, that I might make them desolate to the end, that they might know that I am the Lord. Now, that's an that's a interesting statement there because it still works for our good. You see, God really, He really just wanted, He wanted us to, to, to for one, to repent for our sins, show mercy. The knowledge of God, more than that. Even Isaiah says this. Jeremiah says it. All the prophets say this. But Ezekiel brings it out as well that it's not God's perfect will, but he permitted it. But there again, 
notice what he does, and I polluted them in their own gifts, and that they caused to pass through the fire, all that openeth the womb. In other words, we, the, the children of Israel, according to the law that God, Moses gave them, were to bring the firstborn of the flocks as a sacrifice unto God, right? That I make them desolate to the end that they might know that I am the Lord. That last sentence in white, that I might make them desolate, was speaking about the coming of Christ where it, the things become desolate because it would, take, it would take this in order to bring about the coming of Yeshua to the end that they might know that I am the Lord. That's the only way they're going to know who God really is. All this, in other words, this stuff has to happen. Now watch this. I'll prove it to you that it's for that purpose. I saw something, friends, I saw something tonight I've never seen in my life in the book of Romans. And I already know, Romans 11 is a perfect type showing that Israel has to be back in their homeland. In fact, I'm going to probably hit on that just a little bit too, but that's for the sake of my black brothers and sisters that, that I know they love the Lord, but they really believe that they're, uh, uh, they're part of Israel, and they may be. Let me say something, brother, sister. If you believe you're part of Israel, sometimes you find out you are Jewish descent, but don't knock out your other brothers just because they don't have the same color skin. It doesn't matter what color you are. Okay, so you may be part of Israel. So I'm not against that, but I got to show you what the word of God is saying about what's going on. All right, so let's first, before we hit Romans 11, let's hit Romans 8, 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Notice that, until now. That's, that's Paul speaking. They say Paul wrote Romans, all right? Now, the word that's used there for the whole creation, it can be creation or creature, either one. But notice, for we know that the whole creation or creature groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Together? Who are they, who are they, who are they groaning in pain with? With the human race. The animal race is suffering as well as a result of the sin of Adam and Eve. They're suffering because of our own sins. Now watch what it says. And not only they, but ourselves also. Who's the they? It's the creation or the creatures. Remember, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of animals were being slaughtered in the temple. And all the way back through time, they were being slaughtered in the temple, all right? But ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves with it, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. All right, now Paul's showing you a type here, but watch what he says when you drop down to verse 27 and 28. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now watch what he says in verse 28. And verse 28 is referring back up to verse 22. And we know that all things work together, see, for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. All right, look at it again. And we know all things work together. What all things? See, the whole creation groaneth in pain together until now. So when he says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, all things work together. What is he talking about? In other words, our suffering and their suffering, the creation's suffering, was all working together, see, for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. That's the creation and the creatures. See, that's both us and them. So in other words, the fact that the animals, they were a type, they were foreshadowing, they were showing there was a coming Messiah. And they're suffering at the very hands of a sacrificial system. Why? Because man could not recognize that God desired mercy more than sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. And because that the, the children of Israel could not recognize that, they suffered even more so at the hand of man. But at the same token, it still was working together for our own benefit for the coming of the Messiah. All right, now, let's look at it deeper. Matthew chapter 12, verse 7. 
But if you had known what this meaneth, that's what Yeshua says, I will have mercy, not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless. Most scholars have applied this to Yeshua. But according to Howard's Hebrew Gospel, he actually translates it as you would not have bound the innocent. And it's in masculine plural, speaking of the sacrifices, which seems to make more sense because what does Yeshua do? He goes into the temple and he frees all the animals. And he says, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it into a den of thieves. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Yeshua goes into the temple and he, not only does he loose all the animals, but he beats the money changers out. See, everybody has just looked at this saying that well, it was because they were selling them. They shouldn't have been selling them in the temple. No, sir, that not, has nothing to do with it. Go look at the original language. They weren't, he didn't want the house of God as Isaiah says in chapter 1, what meaneth this trampling in my courts? It's not God's perfect will. Now, he knows because he had permitted it and he set the Levitical law up. And then there's those that would ask, you know, Steve, what about, you know, Abraham sacrificing the, the, the ram, etc. All those are types and shadows. Sure, I believe that. All right, but the thing is, it's not God's perfect will. And he's trying to get us to the perfect will. And that's my point right here. To my Jewish brethren and to my Christian friends, if to my Jewish brethren, I say this here, if the offering of the bulls and goats that we were offering in the temple, the time when Yeshua came, was all God required in order to purge us of our sins, then what fault did he find in us? And if it's truly without fault there, then why could he find fault when Christ was offered up as well as a sacrifice? Because truly, as the Christians would say, Christ was the Lamb of God. And I agree with that. He is the Lamb of God that take away the sin of the world. I believe that. And without his life being given, there could be no remitting of that sin. There could, it could not be remitted. But I still hold that it's through repentance because John came repeating repentance is where, the, was where that starts at. The life of Yeshua, him dying, it's not the fact that he died and that... Okay, we're going to break this down and just say it. Let me, let me back up before I get to that. Let's, let's go into Exodus 17. Then we're going to come right back to that. All right. One, we know Yeshua says, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. If you, you know, if you knew what this meant, I, I, I will have mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. All right? He was talking about the animals, not himself. All right? 17, Exodus 17, 1. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do with this people? They almost are ready to stone me. Isn't that what they were about to do to Yeshua? Isn't that what they were going to do to Jesus? They were ready to stone him. Every time he turned around and began to preach the truth of the gospel, they were ready to stone him. And I'm just his little servant, and I almost get stoned half the time when I go to say something. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on, on before the people, and take with thee the elders of Israel, and thy rod, wherein thou smotest the river, take in thine hand, and go. And behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, and the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. By the way, the rock followed him through the wilderness. The second time God says to Moses, speak to the rock that it bring forth its waters. He doesn't. He gets angry. He smites the rock because of the rebellion of the people. All right? But this is the point about the whole part about the sacrifice. Remember, what did I say? 
over here in, uh, what is it, Romans? Yeah, Romans. See? And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. In other words, for we know that the whole creation groans and travaileth in pain together until now. Until Yeshua came, it was all groaning together. Why? Because the animals were being sacrificed for the sins of the people. See? And we were groaning as the sinners because it was not, it, it did not take away the sin. It did not take away the remembrance of the sins. It could not purge us the way we needed to be purged. We needed the life of God to come back upon us. So, all of this, regardless of how it came about, it still worked together for the good. Because why? God knew that the prophecies had to be fulfilled. Okay? He knew that the prophecies had to be fulfilled of Exodus 17. Because it is a prophecy. When he tells Moses to take the elders of Israel with you and go out there and smite the rock that it bring forth its waters, and use the same rock, by the way, that you smote the river with, there's no coincidence in that either. But take that rod and smite that rock that it bring forth its waters. Now, Yeshua was that rock. All right? He was that rock. Remember my Jewish brethren when he said to the, to, to, to the woman at the well, if you knew who it was that was speaking to you, you would ask me for a drink of water and I would bring you water that you don't have to come to this well no more. She said, sir, tell, tell me, where do I get this water? He was giving her a sign to look for. And when he was smitten on Calvary, that water did come forth from his side. That's why Moses takes that rod. That's why God says, take the rod. And he specifically says to him, wherewith thou smotest the river in Egypt. Why? Because he is that water of life. And when that river was smitten in Egypt, it was showing that the waters of life, the river of life, that water of life that flows was going to be smitten. And when it was going to be smitten, it was going to come out mixed with blood and water. And my rabbi friends today, do you not know, as Rabbi Orly says, states clearly, that the temple itself was laid out like the human body, and the Holy of Holies is where the heart was. And Yeshua, when that spear went in his side, it thrust through, as the prophet Zechariah states, not pierced, but thrust through his side, and forthwith went blood and water out of his body. And the same thing that come out of the temple, out of the side of the temple, where they had a little trough that would wash that blood from every animal sacrifice, would wash it out, it came out the side just like where the spear stabbed Yeshua in that side right there. You've got a type sitting right there before you day in and day out after every sacrifice and nobody paid attention. As I said, sacrifice was not God's perfect will. And why do I say that? Why do I keep making that point? Maybe this might help you as well. God didn't want man to fall. God had no intention for Adam and Eve to fall, but he put them here on free moral agent and they chose, they willfully sinned against God. You understand? It's not his will. Just like Yeshua says, you know, or God says, it's not God's will that any man should perish, but all might come to the repentance. You understand? God's perfect will was for sin never to get here in the first place. That's how we know that sacrificial system is not the perfect will of God. And we know that too because why? In the millennial reign, all the animals will be here and there will nothing shall die nor hurt nor destroy in all of my holy mountains. So there's not going to be a steak dinner. Just like it was in the Garden of Eden. There was no killing. The animals were not killed in the Garden of Eden. That was God's perfect will. But now we're in the middle of the permissive will. Now we're admitted in the, the part, when I say permissive, because what? God permitted. Brother Aaron, that's the answer to your question right there. Remember what we showed up there just a moment ago. See, he permitted this. Um, this is under the, uh, the sense of James. Because of this, he did permit them to sacrifice. All right? And we find that as well when we get all when we get into Ezekiel as well. Well, Ezekiel, he says he gives him this laws there, but we see that it works together for good. All right. So, and that good is the fact that the rock has got to be smitten. The rod that he uses, same one he hit the river with, 
right? And it brings forth that water. Now, let's continue on. Again, Matthew 12, 7. But if you had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Revelation 22, 1. In light of that rod in the river. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. I wonder if that's that same river that went into Eden and watered all the land. All right, Exodus 17, 6, And thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. Yeshua is that river of water, right? So, going back to Romans 8, just to kind of look at it, and we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God. All right? Whichever brother or sister who sent me about raising the screen, I hope that did help back there. I, I can see it does sit a little bit higher. John chapter 19, verse 33. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he, that he was dead, already they break not his legs, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. All right? Pierced his side. Same thing as thrust through. In Hebrew, we say thrust through in Zechariah. All right. The water and the blood came out. Remember, John 1, 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming into the hill and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. How does he take away the sin of the world? He becomes that sacrifice. How does he take away that sin? What did God say he desires more? Mercy and the knowledge of God. You know what will help you get the knowledge of God? It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. When his side was pierced and that water came from his side and that blood was mixed in there, it was showing to the children of Israel as an open sign that the rock that Moses smote was following them still in the wilderness. This time he was there in Israel. He was there. He specifically told him the rod that he smote the river with so that they would know that when the rock was smitten in the future that it would bear forth not only water but blood as well because that same rock that smote the river changed that river into blood. In other words, when the rock was going to be smitten somewhere along the way, the river, the water of the rivers of life was going to turn bloody as a result. But why did it have to be to have, this have to happen? Because you see, my Jewish brethren, all the way back to the Garden of Eden, when God made Adam, he made humankind, in other words. Adam was humankind. And he breathed, ipak bepa'av nishmar chayim, he breathed his own life in a plural form into that one body called Adam. Why was it in a plural form? Because Eve, inside that body, was inside there with Adam. I, let me tell you something. She had to have been there because God couldn't have took her from him unless she was already there. And the thing was, was he didn't have to breathe nowhere in, her, in the scripture. Does it say he breathed in her nostrils? Or chai, even, you know, uh, <laughs> it doesn't say that. Why? Because she's already got the Holy Spirit inside of her, the very life of Almighty God. The Chayim is God's own life. That's why she's called Isha, the fire of Yahweh. See, and he is called Ish, the fire, again, of Hashem. All right? This is what's there. We know that the word Yahweh is not the name of God. It's not the right way to pronounce it. No man knows that right name, the right way to say it. All right? But the point is, is... That's what Ish and Isha is. And rabbis, you know this already that the scripture or the, the sages have stated that it the 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 uh the uh Ish you have right there and you have Isha, you have the word fire, Aish, and you have God's divine name using the yot and the and the hay from hers. Put them together, we have God's divine name with the fire there. Put it together, you have God's own life inside of them. But when sin came in the Garden of Eden and they fell from, 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 from the grace of God, see, they forfeited that life. They forfeited the eternal life and therefore they went back to the dust. And the body could not hold that kind of life. 
but there was one body that could hold it. Wow. From dust thou art till dust thou shalt return. When he returned to the dust, he released that life out of him. He was the second Adam. And inside of him was already the Chaim, the life, both masculine and plural. Life was inside of him, and it was going to come back upon the believer. But the only way to get it out, my brother Jews, my brother friends there in Israel, was in order for him to be put into a deep sleep, just as Adam was put into a deep sleep, in order for God to take out Eve from his side, God had to put the second Adam into a deep sleep in order to take and open up his side on the rib side there and pull out his bride from, from, from his side. You understand what I'm saying? All right, so therefore, all things work together for them that love God. It had to happen. The sacrificial lambs that have been a type and a shadow of the coming of the Messiah, these things, they have, they have grown together with us in pain. They have suffered their lives of their firstborn, every firstborn. You think it was hard. It wasn't just hard for Adam or it wasn't just hard for uh, Abraham when he was going to offer up his son. It's not just hard for God to offer up his son, but it was also hard for every animal that was ever on the earth that had to offer up all their firstborn as well. They have groaned in travail, in pain together with us. And they have borne a huge price as well. No wonder why Yeshua set them free. He was setting those animals free, letting them know, I've come here to take your place. He didn't just take our place. He, he took their place too so that the stop, the sacrificial system could be stopped because he was that lamb. See, the blood of the bulls and goats cannot come back upon us. It doesn't give us eternal life, my brother, sister. Let's move on. Now, my, if my, my brothers and sisters, especially the, the, the black brothers and sisters that are listening, that are, that are caught up in this movement that only the black people are the Jews. I want you to play for, for you especially, and I say this with love and respect to you, because I realize in your case there, you need to know the truth as well. Because if you are truly a part of the house of Judah, then you need to go home to Israel. There's a day of awakening at hand for Israel, for the house of Judah. Let's look at this. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 7. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God and as the angel of the Lord before them. Now, the reason why the Lord has to defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he calls it, notice, he defends the inhabitants of Jerusalem, which are the uh, tents of Judah that are returning, because he knows that they have to fulfill this prophecy of Zechariah. So he's going to defend them. This is why you see the great battle of 1967 war after Israel became a nation in 1948. Now, I'm not justifying, by the way, friends, all the battles and all the evils that have happened in the land of Israel. Many people would say, oh, the Rothschilds did it. Oh, the, the Zionists did it, the, the Illuminati. Let me tell you something. God has got the house of Judah there. He said they have to come home first. They're coming home for a reason. And if this isn't the house of Judah, then you might as well obliterate the entire land of Israel and start all over again and find out who belongs there. Well, you know what? God knows how to bring the right people back for that purpose. Just like he brought Moses to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt and sent them to the promised land. Just like he brought them down into Egypt to save their life from the famine uh, in Canaan. All right? God knows what he's doing. And this is his plan, not ours. Okay? And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and the supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Now the word pierced is not in Hebrew, it's thrust through. But my Jewish brethren, that's why I pointed out to you from the book of John, when they put that spear into his side, they wouldn't use the word in Greek pierced, but it means thrust through. Okay? And I do believe that that's what it's speaking of. Now, David in the Psalms clearly identifies, they pierce my hands and my feet. He speaks about this in the first person. 
as if it's David that they're doing this to. They wag their head. They, they, they spit upon me. They pluck out my beard. Everything that happened to Yeshua, David does in the first person. That kind of reminds me also, another one all completely different, but in Isaiah, Isaiah speaks about, and he does it in the first person as well. He says, uh, speaking about, what is it, Isaiah uh, 8, I believe, uh, chapter 8, or chapter 6, I believe, where he speaks about the coal of fire, and the, and the angel took, he said, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people with unclean lips. And the angel took the coal of fire from off of the altar and he touched his lips and he says, now your lips are purged. Because he said, who can we get to, you know this song that, that they did from there, who can we get to, to go for us? And he says, here I am, Lord, send me. But he was a man of unclean lips and dwelt among a people of, un, of unclean lips. Do you know that I believe that in the first person that was actually representing Moses? Even though it was done after the fact. I say that because if you've ever read the book of Jasher on the story of Moses, when Moses was just a child, what did he do? Took the crown off of Pharaoh's head and put it on his own head. Well, they wanted to kill him for it. But God had to spare Moses. Balaam, who happened to be one of the wise men for, for, for Egypt at that time, wanted him dead for it. Pharaoh calls in all the wise men of Egypt. They come in there. He says, what should we do? The Lord sends an angel down to act as if he was one of the wise men. And he spoke up and said, oh, wise Pharaoh, he said, bring to him an onyx stone and a, 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 a I'm sorry, a sapphire stone and, uh, and, a, and a coal of fire. And if he goes for the onyx stone or the sapphire, he said, then you'll know he did it with wisdom. But if he goes for the coal of fire, you will know that he did it uh, in ignorance. And they said when they did it before the little child who was about two years old said Moses actually went for that sapphire stone. But the angel of the Lord miraculously moves his hand, grabs that coal of fire. It's extinguished in his hand and puts it to his lips, burns his lips. Think about that. Just an interesting thought anyway. Back to Zechariah though. They shall look upon me whom they have thrust through, in other words. John 19.34 says the same thing. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. And shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. So Rabbi Singer, when you talk about this, it was Pyrrhus, and they always say, well, it's his hands and his feet they're talking about. No, I agree with Rabbi Singer. That is thrust through, and it's not talking about the hands and feet. This was talking about his side that was going to be thrust through when that Roman soldier put that sword through his side. Now, another big argument as well is that they say that the Romans did this. The Romans crucified him. Then why do you put the blame on the Jews? God puts it to our charge because we handed him over. It was the same thing when Joseph was handed over by his brethren to the Ishmaelites, the Midianites, whichever way you want to do it. Midianites were the ones that actually took him and they sold him to the Ishmaelites. Same thing. We, we tried to pass the buck, as it were, but in the story of Joseph, as it is in the story of Jesus, it was for our own good. In other words, all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. Selling Joseph out was for Israel's own good. In other words, selling him as a sacrifice, so to speak, was for the good of Israel in the long run. And we don't understand why the cup was put in his bag? Think about it. Then it goes on to say, Verse 11, and that day there will be a great mourning in Jerusalem as in the mourning of Hadramon in the valley of Megiddon. And the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, their wives apart, the family of the house of Levi apart, their wives apart, the family of Shemai apart, and their wives apart, all the families that remain, every family apart, and their wives apart. That's orthodox custom, by the way. And it's in family order, not tribal order, but God says it's the house of Judah. By the way, 
Nathan and David are the tribe of Judah. Shimei is a Benjamite, Levi the Levites. There's your house of Judah right there, friends. Let's look at history repeating itself. In 2 Samuel 16 and 9, Remember, Peter took, uh, uh, I'm sorry, then said, uh, Abshai, the son of Zariah, unto the king, why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? That was Shimei, Saul's son, cursing King David. He was a crippled boy to begin with. He was spitting on David. David was leaving the king kingdom. Absalom, his son, by the way, Absalom in Hebrew is Absalom, which means my father is peace. And we're not talking about Pope Francis either here, okay? We're talking about King David. His father was peace. But see, notice, no, did you notice what the Pope of Rome, when he come there and he sat at the upper room at King David's tomb and puts on his triple crown sitting there, declaring himself to be King David, declaring to be the Av Shalom, the Antichrist spirit. There's your Antichrist spirit. That's what David's son tried to do. But also in regards to Absalom, when he died, David mourned for him like you wouldn't believe. He said, I would to God that I could have died in your place. He was prophesying of the coming of the Messiah who would die in the place of Israel instead. That's why he mourned so greatly because Yeshua knew that Israel was going to do just like Absalom and reject him. Why? Because Absalom did not have the revelation that David was truly the anointed king and put himself in there instead. It brought about his own destruction just like it did with Israel. brought about their destruction. 70 A.D., everything. But anyway, in this case here, Saul's son comes along. He's mad at David, spits on him because he felt like David had overthrown Saul. It's the same thing they did with Jesus. They come out and they spit on him because you're making yourself king of Israel. You're trying to take David's place. Come on, friends. Drop down to verse 11. And David said to Abshai and to all his servants, Behold my son, which came forth of my bowels, seeketh my life. Talking about Absalom. How much more may this Benjamite do it? See, here's a Benjamite. He wanted to curse David, spit on him, everything. Now, notice David does cross this river. He goes across the Kidron Valley just like Jesus. We, we gets on the Mount of Olives, weeps over Jerusalem just like Yeshua does. Oh, God, does anybody not get anything? Help us, Lord. You get into 2 Samuel, going to chapter 19. By the way, David would not come back until those servants got the people in one mind and one accord. There's your two witnesses coming. See? And Shimei, the son of Greer, Benjamite, which was a Baharim, hasted and came down with the men of Judah to meet the King David. See, he curses him on his way out, but when he's coming back, and there were a thousand men of Benjamin with him, and Ziba, and the servant of the house of Saul, and his 15 sons, and his 20 servants with him, and they went over the Jordan before the king, and there went over ferry boat to carry over the king's household and to do what, the, what they thought good. And Shimei the son of Greer fell down before the king as he was come over uh, Jordan and said unto the king, Let not my Lord impute iniquity unto me, neither do thou remember that which thy servant did perversely the day that my Lord the king went out of Jerusalem, that the king should take it to his heart. You don't think that this Zechariah isn't to Israel today? You don't think that, listen, my Jewish brethren, it says right there, the family of Shemai was a part. Do you know why he does that? He's trying to get you to recognize what Shemai did was going to repeat in another day. And you were going to mourn because this time you thrust through the sun. See, in David's case, you didn't kill him. Only the character. He didn't kill David. It was only his character. A lot of people like to character assassinate people today. My gosh, brother, sister. Now you understand Daniel 9. Remember, watch what, 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 what did he say? Let not my Lord impute iniquity. What does Daniel 9 say? 70 weeks of Daniel. My Jewish brother, sisters, you know, the, the Talmud clearly says, before the destruction of the second temple, this Messiah had to come. Why didn't, where, where, where is he at? 
Why are you looking for him again? Was Daniel's prophecy a lie? Do you really, really believe Daniel didn't prophesy correctly? Or was something wrong with the timeline? What happened? What went wrong? See, so somewhere, seven weeks are determined upon thy people, upon thy holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity. To reconcile. By the way, iniquity in the Hebrew, right there, that word there, is to reconcile that old path that you strayed away from. To bring in everlasting righteousness. Drop down to verse 26, and after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off. That was after 69 weeks, in other words. And if you take it from Artaxerxes' time, bring it right on down to the time of Yeshua. See? He's killed during that time. Now here's interesting. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. There is debate on that. I'm not going to get into it, but I think we should look at both sides of it. Some believe that there's still 70 weeks determined unto the children of Israel. I believe that we've already had the last half of the 70th week is already, or the first half of the last week is already completed, and there's only a half left to go. Now, I've looked at it from both sides, and I have also stood on the side where there was a full week yet to go. But the more that I look at it, it seems that there's only half a week to go. If that's the case, and we see this here, this causes the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, could that have happened when Yeshua went and let all those animals out? And the reason I say this too, some people are looking at the covenant here as being the Antichrist covenant, but in, uh, in Daniel 11 it speaks about the Holy Covenant. So it's only a suggestion, something to think about, friends. I, 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 don't, I don't take one side or the other on that particular issue there, um, but it's something we should consider. So my question is just like it was asked by Joseph in the book of Jasher, when he began to cry out for Joseph. And that was another thing. You know, according to the book of Jasher, and, I, and I, again, I can't say Jasher is authentic, but I look for the common threads that I can find in there that line up with our own canon. But there was one thing that did strike me. And I didn't bring this up last time in a message earlier, but I want to bring it up today. I did bring up the part about how that he gave a map of the stars. He asked Benjamin, was he uh, acquainted with the study of the stars, that he'd heard the Hebrews knew the stars, the, the, the alignments and, and things of that nature there. And he said he was. And he gave him a map of the stars with an instrument, and he said, if that be true, you should be able to find your brother. And that caught my attention. And I can't say that it's correct, but I want to I just present something to you to think about, though, in light of this. And he began to search diligently, and when he did, he divided Egypt into four quarters. And he became astonished. He looked at Joseph. Joseph asked him, why are you so astonished? I'm just paraphrasing it. He said, according to this, the man that sits on the throne is my brother Joseph. And he says, I am your brother. And then he tells him he's going to send him back with his brother, but say nothing to him because he wants to prove that they've truly repented of their sins. Now, that was interesting to me. I can't say it's so or not, but it's interesting. All right? Now, the point, though, the reason why I say it's interesting is because the wise men, according to the Christian Bible, the wise men saw Yeshua's star in the east, and they followed it. By the time they got to Jerusalem, two years later, following the stars, or the star that they knew that identified Yeshua. Some play, people say it was an alignment of some sort, but nonetheless, they followed the stars, and they were able to go right to his house. But the children of Israel didn't have that gift or that ability, so they were consulting. Notice it was also a backslidden king. King Herod was consulting where would the child be born, asking the, the, the rabbis and the wise men of his area there, and they were just looking at the prophecies to try to figure it out that so he was going to be born in Bethlehem of Judea. Only by the prophets. But where did they learn this about the stars? And how were they able to pinpoint Yeshua's location? And if the book of Jeshua is true, they were able to pin, he was able to pinpoint Joseph's location the same way. 
Could it have been, and it's been speculated before, that Daniel was the one that had taught them this, and did they lose this ability after they came out of the Babylonian captivity? I don't know. It's just a, 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 an interesting uh, conjecture. I don't want to call it, uh, I don't take it as a doctrine, I just think it's interesting. Anyway, again, I want to ask my Jewish brethren, Joseph was stripped out of his own coat of many colors. And they stripped him and they put it on a scarlet colored robe, Yeshua. And they put a crown of thorns on Yeshua's head. You know, when Joseph was taken out of his color, coat, this is where we get the, the, the scapegoat and the sacrificial goat from. I believe this is where Moses got that from in the sacrificial law. It was from Joseph. Because see, Joseph, the goat that was killed and his blood was put on Joseph's coat, was taken to his father and discerned, is this is your son or no? That was the sacrifice. And Joseph bore in his own body the sins of his brethren down into Egypt. Yeshua played both scapegoat and sacrificial goat. He not only had his own blood spilled out upon the earth, but he went into the presence of Almighty God as the Lamb of God that was killed on that day. So, I just want to remind my Jewish brethren of a few points here as we close. God spoke from the midst of a burning bush. Yeshua came. And they put a crown of thorns on him. And in Hebrew, Sinai is a thorn bush. And God spoke from the midst of that thorn bush to Moses and gave him the Ten Commandments. Yeshua comes, reaffirms those commandments, and then he's put into a crown of thorns. He's in the midst of a thorn bush speaking out to the children of Israel in an unknown tongue. He walked on the water on Galilee. And in Genesis, we find out that the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. In other words, the Spirit of God walked on the water in Genesis. He placed clay on the blind man's eyes, just like in the beginning when God created Adam and he took clay and he molded him and formed him and made this man and breathe life into him. Yeshua took clay, spit on the ground, made clay from that, put it on his eyes, told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. It wasn't the washing in the pool that did it. It was the fact that he was showing he was the creator that created Adam. He taught his disciples to pray for the return of Israel. When he said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thine will be done. Do you know in that prayer right there when he says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. In other words, sanctify your name. According to Ezekiel 36, the way that God's name is sanctified is when the house of Israel is returned to their homeland. Then God's name will be sanctified. He says to Israel, and he's paraphrasing, he said, I don't do this for your sake, O Israel, but I do it for my name's sake. He says, and when the people see you in your homeland, then my name will be sanctified. Didn't know that, did you? The house of Israel is the last ones to come home, by the way. And told you, you must be born again. Think about that one. It says in Zechariah, they will look upon him whom they pierced, or they thrust through. So, as Joseph said, why are you looking here or there? Yeshua is in your midst. He's only a prayer away. My Jewish brothers, sisters, and even if you're not a Jew, I want to introduce you tonight to Yeshua. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, He came and He died as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. All you have to do is believe it and repent of your sins. Repent of your sins. 
and that life that was in him on Calvary before he died. And when he died, and our fathers thrust him through to allow his life to come out. What they meant for evil, as I've often said, what the Jews meant, the Benjamites of that day meant for evil when they cried out, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. God turned it for our good. Had his blood not been spilled, his life would have never come back upon us and upon our children. It was the only way to get that blood out or to get the life out so it could come back upon us. If we will repent of our sins, He is there to give us the Holy Spirit, the very life that He gave Adam and Eve to restore eternal life. Think about it. I'm Stephen Benoon. You've been watching Israeli News Live, our prophetic moment, whatever you want to call it tonight. Thank you for those of you that are supporting this work. You're the ones that make this type of moments possible. God bless you. Shalom.